Good evening and welcome to APTN National News Weekend. I'm Dennis Ward. Two Saskatchewan sisters say their murder convictions were a miscarriage of justice. And now, after 30 years, there's a glimmer of hope. As Justice Minister David Lametti has agreed to review their sentences. APTN's Fraser Needham begins this story with one of the sisters on the phone to family as she heads to the airport after a long day in Ottawa. So their next step is we could be out in a month. Really? Yes, my sister, I mean, my girl, no more, no more prison life. I'm going to be home with you girls and we're going to make up for this. I love you. Mom, my girl, you'll be proud of mom. That's Adelia Cusance talking to her daughter, Haley Koch. Are you excited? Or Adelia and her sister, Narissa, were convicted of second-degree murder in 1994. Their cousin, Jason Kashane, a youth at the time, has confessed to the murder. At a press conference earlier in the day, she described the toll it has taken on her. 30 years is a long time. That's cruel and unusual punishment. And you know what? I'm going to kind of relate to even animals don't get locked up like that you know today I do I, I do suffer with PSD and all that stuff because you know sitting in prison for so many years wondering you know why 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 and she says she really wants to make up for lost time with her family when I do get my freedom back I'm gonna go home to be with my children and right now my children have resentments towards me so I'm going to reassure them that they're okay and that that cycle that I've been through is, is broken and, you know, they're safe and they have a mother. Lawyer James Lockyer represents the two sisters so who are from the Kisakus First Nation. He says they are victims of a two-tiered justice system. If they had been white, would they have been arrested in the first place for the murder? Probably not. If they were white and they'd been arrested for the murder, would they have been convicted of it? No. And if they were white and they'd been convicted of the murder, would they by now be out on parole? Absolutely, for sure they would. Of course they would. Lockyer says he has reason to believe that Justice Minister will seriously review the case. A few hours after saying that, the lawyer received a letter from the Justice Minister's office saying that he will indeed review the case. And Adelia says she has reason to be hopeful, at least for today. Right now, I'm just in disbelief. Like I'm, I'm so great. I'm, I'm so much gratitude, and you know, having this faith and not giving up. That's what me and Narissa tell each other not to give up. Lockyer is in the process of moving bail applications for the sisters so they could be free within a month. Fraser Needham, APTN National News, Ottawa. And you can find much more on that story on our website, aptnnews.ca. An unidentified Cree woman found murdered in California over 40 years ago has returned home to her family for burial. APTN's Chris Stewart talks to her niece, Violet, who never stopped searching for her aunt. In 1980, Shirley Suse's body was found in an almond orchard in California. She had been sexually assaulted and stabbed to death. With no identification, she was considered a Jane Doe, and she was buried. Shirley was a traveler, and from the Samson Cree Nation in Alberta. She traveled to B.C. and lived there. She mentioned visiting a friend in Seattle. The last time the family heard from her was in 1979. Violet Suse traveled to B.C. for decades, looking in morgues and hostels to find her lost aunt. She had no success. Then, in 2020, Violet contacted an American nonprofit called the DNA Doe Project, who tried to find missing Jane and John Doe's families. Since 2017, they have identified over 80 Jane and John Doe's. She saw a Facebook post from them saying that a Jane Doe from Kern County, California, had been traced to the prairies by DNA. The DNA matched her aunt Shirley. After 40 years, her aunt had been found. In 2012, Winston Charest was convicted of killing Shirley and another Jane Doe in California. Now Shirley's remains have been returned to her family in Samson Cree Nation, Alberta, for a wake and burial. 
Violet Suse says she was finally able to fulfill her promise to her grandmother to find Shirley. She spoke to the media outside a wake held in the nearby town of Wetaskiwin. Most of all today is relief that I'm able to uh, ensure that the promise I made to my grandmother, who is the matriarch on, on my father's side, that um, to find her and to bring her home, that is, this is the final step. Finding her was one two years ago. Um, bringing her home is, is today. Today is that final step. She says she started the search as a young woman and has grown old looking. It's no more not knowing. It's no more uncertainties. We are certain she's home now and we are certain that we can visit her her gravesite even though we know spiritually she's already in, in in with creator and all our ancestors we know that the funeral for Shirley was held on Saturday Violet says finding her lost aunt after 40 years means anything can happen we lose a lot of our young men our young women our girls our boys you know, adult men and women don't give up. Like, don't, don't give up because there is hope. If I can do it after 40 years, you know, with today's technology, uh, there's different mechanisms that can be utilized to, to find our loved ones. Uh, that's a message, like, don't give up. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Wetaskiwin, Alberta. Quite a story. The province of Alberta is launching a public inquiry into the death of Lillian Vanass. She's the woman AP10 told you about who died in a Hannah Alberta hospital on Christmas Day 2020. The cause of her death isn't known. Her husband Corey Ashley has been pushing Alberta's medical examiner to call an inquiry. It's not clear yet exactly when that will happen, but the inquiry will be led by a judge and a report and recommendations will be handed to the Minister of Justice. Members of the National Indian Residential School Survivor Circle met with Catholic Archbishops in Winnipeg this week. On the table, the Pope's visit to Canada and the wording to be included in his apology. Daryl Stranger has that story. We're going to get the work done. And that the Catholic Church is going to be there supporting us. Former Assembly of First Nations Regional Chief Ken Young believes the meeting this morning in Winnipeg will lead to positive outcomes when the Pope visits this summer. Young, along with former AFN National Chief Phil Fontaine and other survivors, met archbishops to discuss the Pope's visit and apology. He's coming to Canada. He's coming to treaty land. And he has to say, I am sorry for what happened to your people and your children on behalf of the Catholic Church. How he says it is the prevailing outstanding issue. The group has survivors from across Canada to help deal with various topics regarding residential schools and the Pope. We brought all uh, representatives from each of the regions across Canada to form our Residential School Survivors Circle group here to deal with uh, issues such as uh, the apology that's in front of us, in front of us um, with, uh, with, with the Poop's visit to North America or to Alberta and uh, this, the little some of the logistics we talked about and also the working relationship that we have ongoing with the bishops. One of the main priorities the group is looking at is getting survivors to one of the three locations the Pope is visiting. The, the big priority right now is uh, how, do we, how do we get our survivors to Lac St. Anne's or Edmonton where, where the, the Pope is coming to. Uh, we feel that from Manitoba West, 
everybody will be going to Lac St. Anne's because there's, there's uh, two events that we're aware of in, the, in Edmonton. Edmonton Archbishop Richard Smith believes the Pope is committed to doing the right thing, but his health might not cooperate. The visits are scheduled from July 24th to the 29th in Edmonton, Quebec City and the Calouite. Probably the clearest indication of his desire to make this work is the fact that he's coming at all. I'm delighted that he's coming, obviously, but as a bishop I'd be very happy to see the Pope come here. But as I was sharing with the group earlier, I'm also astonished because of his health, his stamina, his, his limited mobility. And I wouldn't be surprised, I do not know this, just so you know, but I wouldn't be surprised if people were advising him not to travel at all. Survivors hope more meetings will take place at the level they were at today, but it is unclear if that will happen. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Thanks, Daryl. Time for a quick break. Still to come, guilty verdicts for an Alberta man and his son who shot and killed two Métis hunters. Welcome back. The first week of a Police Services Act hearing against two Thunder Bay police officers has concluded. The officers are facing Police Services Act charges of discreditable conduct and neglect of duty for their roles in the death investigation of Stacy DeBungi, who was found dead in a Thunder Bay River in October of 2015. One of those officers has already pleaded guilty to the neglect charge but the two have pleaded not guilty to the other charges. Brad DeBungi, Stacy's brother, testified this week that police told him his brother was drunk, passed out, and rolled into the river. Brad eventually filed a complaint with the Ontario Police Watchdog, and that complaint led to an independent investigation and the Broken Trust Report. Released in 2018, Broken Trust concluded systemic racism exists within the Thunder Bay Police Service. In October of 2021, the Ontario Provincial Police launched an investigation into the death of DeBungi. The hearing continues next week. In Alberta, a jury has taken just over five hours to find Grant Sneesby guilty of manslaughter. The former trucker was charged with second-degree murder in the death of Gloria Gladue, a 44-year-old from Big Stone Cree Nation in northern Alberta. Sneesby admitted in court he hid her body on a farm in Manitoba for more than a year, but insisted he stabbed her in self-defense. Still in Alberta, where an Edmonton jury found an Alberta man and his son guilty of killing two Métis hunters in 2020. APTN's John Murray met with the two deceased men's families and has more. Well, yesterday was Gina Lavasser is uh, Jacob Sampson's sister. She says even though the trial is over, the situation has been challenging for the whole family. There is a lot of feelings here. There's a lot of emotion in our family running deep. It's not, it's bittersweet. A jury heard that Jacob Sampson and Morris Cardinal were moose hunting on March 27, 2020. They were driving to another family member's home when they stopped briefly on the approach to the driveway at Roger Billado's farm. Roger Billado got in his truck and pursued Sampson's truck. He called his son Anthony and said, bring a gun. Cardinal and Sampson would be found dead on the road the next morning. After deliberating all day Tuesday, the jury came back with a verdict at the end of the day. Anthony Billado is convicted of one count of second-degree murder in the death of Morris Cardinal and convicted of manslaughter in the death of Jacob Sampson. Billado's father, Roger Billado, was convicted of two counts of manslaughter for his role in the deaths of Cardinal and Sampson. Jacob and Morris' family say though the guilty verdicts bring some justice, they are still dealing with their pain. It hasn't really quite hit 100% yet fully. Uh, we're still reeling from the fact that Jacob and Morris have been taken from us. Unfortunately, it ends in the court soon and sentencing will be in the fall, but it doesn't end for us because we go home and our family has been taken. It's no longer the same. Our children are without their elders, they're without their knowledge keepers, and there is a giant 
empty space in our hearts where these men were. The Crown Prosecutor in his closing statement said that Billado escalated the situation by bringing a gun to a fist fight. Jacob had no weapon, Jacob had no gun in his hands, and it is heartbreaking because his life, it seems, doesn't mean anything. He is just a statistic now. The chase along the rural road reached over 150 kilometers per hour. He chased and followed two men down a public road. He cut them off and he tried to run Jacob over and then turns around and claims self-defense. They just wanted to have a conversation while bringing a gun. What message does that tell our people? It tells our people that it's open season and that if you are non-Indigenous, it's okay to shoot, shovel, shut up. Sentencing is expected in the fall. John Murray, APTN National News, Edmonton. Millions of dollars. We already knew that's how much Ontario Provincial Police spent during their 1492 land back operation two years ago. But the OPP tried to retract already released records and alter figures to hide the real costs. After months of fighting for them, the uncensored numbers were obtained exclusively by APTN's Brett Forrester. Here's Brett to explain. This is how the Ontario Provincial Police spent much of 2020 through 2021 in Caledonia. Manning barricades, idling in cruisers and patrolling the streets surrounding the 1492 Landback Lane camp. Now, figures obtained exclusively by APTN reveal how much money they spent. Nearly $21 million. Those numbers, like, they just don't, like, I, I think they're just so astronomical that, like, it, it's hard to even put it into context. Skylar Williams is the spokesman for the Land Back group. The numbers left him stunned. It's a far cry from what I think, or think of when I think of reconciliation. The OPP initially tried to hide these numbers and only released them following a lengthy fight in the Freedom of Information system. Last year, APTN reported the police spent more than $16 million in just six months. But the OPP soon tried to retract that document and replace it with a censored one containing altered figures. When APTN requested a year's worth of costs, they released this document claiming police only spent $14 million. But its top line, showing how much was paid in salaries, was deleted, meaning the total was wrong. This uncensored version was disclosed after APTN appealed to the province's information commissioner. It shows the force actually spent almost $21 million. The bulk of it, $18.2 million, went towards salaries and overtime, the rest went to other expenses like transportation, food, and hotels. Williams calls it more evidence Indigenous resistance is over-policed. You know, and we see this across, you know, every Indigenous movement that has happened to, to, to protect our lands, protect our waters. Um, this exact same kind of response around trying to cover up the fact that they're watching everything. There's a lot of questions that I would like, like, like to have answered that I know are never going to be answered. The figures left Courtney Skye, like, like Williams, with questions with and, and little just, hope of answers. You see them trying to hide it because it just, once you see those numbers laid out, it just becomes so clear that the priorities of the Crown are wrong. They're set on oppression. They're set on just using their powers to inflict violence on communities. They're she says governments to need it. to be held accountable and... for making the guys with guns the lead agency in a centuries-old land dispute, then giving them a blank check. That $20 million hasn't solved the problem. It hasn't dealt with the root cause of the issue. Of course, it's wasted. We're not actually addressing like the underlying issues. The OPP responded by statement saying they couldn't ignore the potential for violence or illegal activity. The force never offered a legal reason for withholding information, only that they'd rather not report the regular wages officers earned while working on the file. Brett Forster, APTN National News, Ottawa. Great work, thanks Brett. Time for another quick break. Still to come, a Juno Award winner hits the road for the first time since the start of the pandemic. Stick around.
Welcome back. Judo Award winner Crystal, Crystal Shawanda is once again touring after the COVID outbreak. APTN's Chris Stewart spoke to the blues singer at a recent stop in Edmonton. Crystal Shawanda won the 2021 Juno for Best Blues Album. With her vocal range and energy, it's easy to see why. Even competing against the Oilers and Flames Battle of Alberta, she packed the Blues on White in Edmonton. With an upcoming album in the fall, she says it's based on hope. Living in Nashville during COVID, her and her husband Dwayne took their daughter on night walks to avoid crowds. We go for a walk and we try to make it fun for our little girl, like, oh, let's look, you know, look at the moon, look at the stars. And so one night when we were going for a walk, she said, mom, let's go take a little walk with the moon. And me and my husband looked at each other. And so that's actually the title of one of the songs on the new album is Take a Little Walk with the Moon. She says her blue sound shouldn't be limited to Indigenous categories. In some situations, um, sometimes people try to force me into that Indigenous slot, into that Indigenous lane. And, um, and sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it does make sense. And sometimes it doesn't. Um, like in the past, um, you know, as far as like my music is mainstream. It's, and so I don't feel it's fair taking up space in a category that was created for traditional Indigenous music. I think that should be reserved for people, who, for artists who are doing traditional Indigenous music. Her debut album, Dawn of a New Day, debuted in 2008 and hit the Billboard Top 20. Back then, she sang country, but her heart was in the blues. Her future albums have been blues, and she says her country fans have continued supporting her. I appreciate all the support for everybody who has followed me over from my country music days over to the blues world now. Um, I really do appreciate it, especially all my fans who tell, who tell me again and again, whether you're singing country blues, it's still Crystal Shawanda music. And so I've loved having that reminder. And so that's something that I tend to say now is it's still Crystal Shawanda music. So thank you so much to my fans for realizing that. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Sounds good. I've been out to a few shows in the last little bit, and it's great to see live music again. That's going to do it for us here on your APTN National News for this weekend. For much more or news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.